In this video, I'm going to explain why I believe in the death penalty and why you should too. I'm going to counter all of the main arguments against the death penalty, but I also want to preface the video by saying that I only believe in the death penalty in a country where you have a fair uh, justice system. And for me, that means having a unanimous jury system, unlike the one that we have in the United Kingdom today, which means, of course, that I wouldn't be in favour of reintroducing the death penalty in my country as it stands. And it also means that I am opposed to every single execution which has taken place in countries such as China, because they obviously do not have a fair justice system. But if we were to go back to the sort of justice system that we had about 50 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, then I would be in favour of reintroducing the death penalty as we had it in the United Kingdom pre the 1957 Homicide Act. The most commonly used counter to the death penalty, and I think that the reason why most people are so reluctant to think that reintroducing the death penalty would be a good idea, is the possibility of innocent people being executed. And whilst this is obviously a terrible thought, there's, there is really nothing worse than the thought of someone being innocently killed. This is a false argument, it's a false principle, at least for most of the people who make it. Because to make this argument, you have to be also a pacifist. You have to believe that the possibility of killing innocent people rules out every single activity in which that possibility is there. And yet most of the people who make this argument against the death penalty are in favour of having an armed force, of having uh, transport systems which inevitably kill people. For instance, reducing the speed limit to 30 miles per hour everywhere would reduce the number of innocent deaths in this country immensely, and yet we don't do that because we accept not even in, in a justice system, but simply to travel quicker for convenience, we accept the loss of innocent lives. So even on even when you're not trading lives, you're just trading time, you're just trading convenience for innocent lives, people are in fact prepared to, to, to go along with the reality that innocent people will inevitably die sometimes. Now, if you are a true pacifist, if you believe that we should ban motor cars, if you believe that we should uh, remove our, our armed forces, if you believe that in any situation where an innocent person may die, we should stop doing that thing, then fine, you can be against the death penalty for that reason, you can use this argument. But the reality is that you, you're probably not that sort of person. And of course, I have to now make the argument that the death penalty deters people from committing murder, and that therefore by removing the death penalty, you are putting innocent people at risk, because innocent people are more likely to be murdered without the death penalty. That's obviously the, the corollary to this position. Now let's just put this in real numbers. I don't know the numbers from the top of my head exactly, but I believe it's something like, in the United Kingdom, every three years, two murders are committed by convicted murderers who are released from prison. That's to say that if we had the death penalty, we would be preventing the, the murders of two innocent people over a three year period. So let's say, let's, I'll even give the, the people who are against the death penalty the, the most lenient representation of those figures. Let's say it's one murder every two years. So we are accepting the loss of one innocent life every two years or 0 0.5 every year. Now let's compare that with the number of innocent people who were wrongly convicted and who were executed. I believe if you look at the whole of the 20th century in the United Kingdom, there are only at most three or four cases that I can think of where someone was wrongly convicted. And even then there are, there are still disputes about that. So two, two or three at most over the whole 
or let's just say over 50 years, um, I don't think that this, this compares at all with the, the, the loss of life simply from murderers who are released after having been convicted. That's not even taking into account the, in my view, the real effect, the real deterrence of, of executing murderers, which is not simply that we execute murderers so that they can no longer kill anyone else. It's that simply having a death penalty in the country deters people from murdering in the first place. Those are the real numbers that we'll have to look into. And so now we'll address the second argument, which is that the death penalty does not deter murderers. The main comparison which is made when people make this argument is between the United Kingdom and the United States of America, or states in the United States of America, where the death penalty is still legal, still used. The problem with this comparison well, the problems are two. The first one being that the, United, this, the history of the United States and the history of the United Kingdom are quite different in that the United States has always been a, has always been a, a particularly violent country. It has quite a different history to us. It has a history of um, racial segregation and violence, which has not been found in the United Kingdom for centuries. So you have that difference already. But then the second... The second problem with this comparison is that the death penalty as it is in death penalty states today is it might as well not exist if you look at the number of people who are actually executed for murder in the united states in states where it's legal it's so low in fact let me read one statistic from texas which is the main one that people think of so in 2008, Texas had 1,322 murders. Do you know how many murderers it executed that year? 13. So as a murderer in Texas, you can, you can basically be almost sure that you will not be executed for murder. And so this brings us to one of the, the difficult points, which is that it's quite hard to establish the presence of deterrence, particularly because the effect of deterrence is based on the law. But of course, you can have a situation in a country where it's still legal to use the death penalty, but where the death penalty has been de facto abolished, as it has in many of the states in the, in the United States of America. They might have the death penalty and they may use it. You know, they have 13 per year in 2008, in that year, um, but it's basically abolished, it's not really used, it's, it's more or less a political tool. Um, and so it's very difficult to say whether the effect of deterrence has, has gone or at what point it, it has gone. And this is something which was actually pointed out by the 1949 UK Royal Commission on Capital Punishment, which was inconclusive on deterrence. As for the UK, the capital punishment, the, the, the system of capital punishment in the United Kingdom was formally abolished in 1965. So it would be quite misleading to use that date as, as the point at which we would expect the deterrence to fall off. Because in 1957, we had the Homicide Act 1957, which basically um, reclassified murder and reclassified the cases in which execution could be used. In other words, the the likelihood of you being executed for crimes which would have which would have given you the death penalty before that act uh, was severely reduced. So I think it it makes sense to conclude that the deterrent effect of the death penalty had been severely reduced after 1957. Yet the official date for the aboli abolition of the death penalty was 1965. So people who are against the death penalty are much more likely to refer to 196, you know, pre-1965 and post-1965 figures. Whereas people who are in favour of the death penalty are much more likely to point out this discrepancy. Uh, the, the reality that the effect of the death penalty as a deterrent had been largely reduced 
even after 1957. And I think it's quite important to note the distinction between certain kinds of murder charges or killing charges as they were back then with today. There's not really much of a distinction in terms of consequences for having been convicted of manslaughter or murder. When you compare the distinction between uh, some kind of life sentence and being hanged by the neck until dead. These are quite different consequences. You can't, you know, several decades, you know, 30 years or 40 years is not really a distinction that would-be murderers are going to make when weighing up the pros and cons of killing someone. Whereas the distinction between a life sentence and being executed is quite a severe distinction for people. And the you know, criminals are rational thinkers. They do weigh up the, the pros and cons of committing their crimes. If there is a death penalty in the country, it is quite likely that a would-be murderer, someone who is, who is premeditating a killing, will take this into account. So when we're dealing with these statistics, we have to be, we have to be aware of the realities in law. It's not as simple as it might as you might think it would be. And another thing that we need to note is that it's not enough to just compare murders before the abolition and murders after. Because one thing that I found quite interesting was that if you were to take all of the serious woundings today, you would find that 50 years ago, many of these would have resulted in murder. In fact, I'll just read this quote. Offences of wounding are now close to the 19,000 mark each year, around triple the total for 30 years ago, as The Independent on Sunday reported on the 27th of April 1997. Britain's murder rate would be at least treble what it is now, but for the improvements in medicine and the growing skills of surgeons and paramedics, medical and legal experts believe. Many people who are now charged with attempted murder or wounding would several years ago have been facing a murder charge as their victims' lives would not have been saved. If you compare the ability of paramedics to treat serious woundings quickly with their ability before 1957, I think you can, you can see how so many of these people would have been murdered. So the most important statistics to compare are not just murders, but attempted murders. If you, if you take attempted murders, murders and serious woundings and lump them into one big category and compare them before the real ab abolition of the death penalty, the, you know, the effective abolition of the death penalty, which was in 1957, and today, you'll see that these numbers are, I, th I think it's over a hundred times greater today. So what's happened? What can actually account for this huge difference in what would be the murder rate if we still had the medical capabilities of, of 1957 United Kingdom? To me, it seems obvious that criminals, murderers who now know that they can escape execution are much more likely to go ahead with their crimes. It was the responsibility of the Home Secretary in the government to pass off on executions. It was their responsibility to send murderers to their deaths. And this is something which modern politicians are not really prepared to do. They don't want the responsibility of something like that. And so now we live in a society where murderers are not properly punished for their crimes. And there is a growing sense of unrest and dissatisfaction with the criminal justice system. People are increasingly taking their own revenge on criminals who they know the police will never catch, the police have no interest in. You see this all the time now, with, particularly with paedophiles, with vigilantes uh, claiming their own justice because the police are either not interested or don't have the ability or the, or the people to do it. And I think if this goes on for much longer, we are increasingly going to see um, individuals or vigilante groups taking their own justice because they know that the criminal justice system is not 
is not up to the task, it's not taking the responsibility. And so that arrangement that we had, that trade that we had with the state to take the responsibility off our hands and put it into their hands will be reversed. The problem with this is not just that the justice which is likely to be dealt out by vigilante groups is going to be particularly cruel and vicious, it's also that there are not the fail-safes in these kinds of systems to produce a reliably accurate verdict. The whole point of the jury system, of our criminal justice system, is so that we can logically and rationally decide who is guilty and who is not. If you, if you have a justice system which doesn't have teeth, which is not prepared to send murderers and even rapists, let's say, to death, then you are very quickly going to find yourself in a situation where people are not satisfied with the outcome. They're not, they're not satisfied. Uh, that They don't really believe that every wrong action is punished, or at least sufficiently punished. And so when you have, when you eventually devolve into a system where people are finding their own justice, you don't have the protections for innocent people. So those innocent people that you were concerned for, the innocent people who you thought might be wrongly convicted and executed, well now you're going to have many, many, many more people being wrongfully executed, lynched and beaten and murdered in the streets rather than going through a proper system where they are judged by, by a jury, where they have to be convicted on the, on the basis of evidence and hopefully unanimously by 12 of their peers. And I think this is, this is the problem really. We're not today prepared to admit or come to terms with the reality that the justice system needs to have teeth. Ultimately, the, the most severe punishment that you can have in a civilised society is, because it's civilised, a quick, clean execution. I think hanging was the best method. Uh, it seemed to be the most reliable, particularly when Pierpoint was doing it. But if you don't have that, we all recognise, for example, when murder, let's say child murderers, child rapists and murderers who have you know, raped countless children and, ra and murdered countless as well. When these sorts of people are given, you know, like 10 life sentences, we know that there has been, that, that this is a joke. That what's the point, what, what's the difference between one life sentence and 10 or two? You can only have one life sentence. You know, if you're dying in prison, it doesn't matter how many time, <laughs> how many of those convictions you have. It makes no difference. What really needs to happen is we go to the next stage, the highest stage, execution. Um, but because we're not, we're, we're not a morally responsible society, we don't have the guts to face the reality here. We don't have the, the guts to send murderers to their deaths. We'll instead send innocent people to their deaths because we don't have to feel responsible for that even though many, more, many, many more people will die, even though people we know perhaps might die, it makes us feel better about ourselves to be against the death penalty because we feel more civilized. We feel like we're better people. I think really without the death penalty, the, de you know, the death penalty is like the, the keystone of the criminal justice system. When you don't have that pinnacle punishment the whole thing starts to become arbitrary or, or, or lacking teeth. And if you can't send a murderer to his death or a, a child rapist to his death, then eventually the whole purpose of, the, the whole idea of punishment starts to crumble away. In fact, I think in this society we're increasingly convincing ourselves that we don't really even believe in punishment, that the whole point is rehabilitation. But this is forgetting that really the primary purpose of the justice system is not, not even to punish people, 
but to deter people from committing crimes in the first place. When you have a strong but fair criminal justice system, which punishes people proportionately for their crimes, i.e. a murderer is executed, then you have a society where people are much less likely to commit these crimes. But that of course means that in cases where people still commit them anyway, you have to be prepared to punish them. You have to still be prepared to say that this punishment is fair and just. And yes, you accept that some innocent people, very few innocent people, still will be killed, will be wrongfully executed. That's not an argument against the death penalty. That's simply an argument for having a strong and fair legal system, a strong and fair justice system. That's, that's an argument for us returning to the system we once had with unanimous jury trials instead of the, the sorts of sham trials we have today where all you need is a majority verdict and you can convict someone and send them to prison for, for decades, what would now be an execution. I wish that there was some way to explain to the sort of left liberal types who hate capital punishment you know, the sort of people who, if you even express the possibility that capital punishment should be returned, they will, you know, that they will be repulsed by you. I wish there was some kind of way that we could explain to them that if you strangle justice, if you draw its teeth, revenge, personal revenge is what you will get. You will get an uncivilized society actually if you're not if if we accept and if we accept because they probably don't if we accept that there's always going to be a need for humans to seek some kind of revenge some kind of punishment for crimes then we have to make the decision about whether we would like to have revenge take place without trials by lynch mobs by vigilantes or whether we would like some kind of justice system where um, suspected criminals are fairly considered by let's say 12 jurors as it is and the evidence is considered and they go through a fair system and w which which leaves open the smallest possible window for innocent people being executed I wish there was some way to convince people that this was the way before we get there, but I, unfortunately I don't think that there is. I think eventually we will get to a point where the vigilante killings and mob justice becomes so commonplace that eventually they will see. Eventually there will, there will come a time when almost everyone believes that we need to reintroduce the death penalty. But the problem with that will be will be in a system then when the justice system is not capable of introducing a death penalty fairly. Because we've so destroyed the fail-safes that we had in place to prevent innocent people from being convicted, having the death penalty come back at that point would be wrong.